Okay, good evening. <clears throat> good evening, everybody, and welcome to this informal scrutiny committee, which is being held remotely due to the current COVID um, Omicron situation. The meeting is being recorded and streamed via YouTube, where members of the public are able to watch the meeting. Please note that any comments posted on the chat feed on the Council's YouTube page during the recording of this meeting will not be monitored by the Council. A recording of this committee will be available on the Council's website following the meeting. I wish to remind members that this is not a formal meeting being held face to face and there's no legislative provision for remote meetings. No formal decisions can be taken on behalf of the Council at this meeting. It is instead an opportunity for members of the committee to debate and give a steer on their views relating to matters on the agenda and for them to subsequently progress by officers. Any urgent decision will be taken by the Chief Executive in accordance with the urgent decision procedure rules that form part of the Council's constitution. All mobile devices should be switched off or set to silent so the meeting is not interrupted by ringtones. Please switch your profile to mute unless you are speaking. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand um, in order that I'm aware that you wish to speak. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> right, um, get started with the meeting then. Um, I've, so, apologies for absence. I have received a apologies from Hazel Green earlier, but um, I haven't received any others. I haven't received any others, Chairman. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and then item two, the performance report and presentation for, for the housing choice team. Um, who's leading that one? Okay, go ahead. If I could just introduce it, Chair, and then I'm going to hand over uh, to the team really to say uh, thank you to for inviting us along this evening to talk about this and really to say the bits that they probably won't say themselves in that we are very, very fortunate in Basildon in the team that we have and the hard work that they and the team do every single day in particularly difficult circumstances, I have to say. And I think the thing to bear in mind with everything that you hear tonight in these services is that this is it's an ever evolving situation, really, and demand always um, outstrips the supply. So these guys are, are juggling uh, resources on a daily basis really but they've put together for you uh, a very very comprehensive uh, presentation this evening so I think I'm going to hand over to Mo mm -hmm. first of all yeah to, uh, to start the presentation. Thanks Leslie. Um, as uh, our director has just said it is a quite a complex um, area of work and it's a big team but the team all intertwines um, to be able to deliver our outcomes you invited us here in September um, because um, I don't think the performance measures that have been presented as part of our corporate plan do tell the whole story. So what we're going to be doing this evening with uh, my managers is to take you through the service and show you some of the performance information that we do collect. For every area of our performance, we collect data. We've got more PIs than, than we care to mention. If it moves, we measure it. And uh, as I say, it is a very, very large team. So in uh, Housing Solutions, which is Phil Warren's team, um, it's made up of the Housing Solutions team, Single People and Rough Sleeper team, um, South Essex Domestic Abuse team, Temporary accommodation, which includes hostel management, and the private sector team who deal with our private sector landlords. And then we'll be following on with uh, Cathy Ayers, who's our rehousing manager, and her team consists of uh, the housing register team, allocations, supported housing, which includes such things as downsizing, tenancy changes, mutual exchanges, and the garage team that deal with all the garage stock. So as I say, every part of our service is measured and all of our performance information is stored on Pentana. Um, and we collect this data for various reasons, to manage our service, to make sure we know that the team are all playing a part within that, and to make sure that we're achieving our outcomes. And some of it is legislative requirements. So it's to satisfy the um, now called um, the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities, 
doesn't roll naturally off the tongue, I've got to say that one. But um, they have statutory figures that we have to return to government office on a monthly basis. And that's so that you have national benchmarking. And also, we are very successful that we go for any grants that become available to be able to supplement our service and our service delivery. But tied to those grants, they want us to measure the outcomes. So again, for government office, we, we collect a lot of data. Um, the performance figures do aid us as managers to analyze the trends and the shortfalls and to be able to work again to try and fill those gaps. As Leslie has already said, certainly the number of approaches and the need for housing will always outstrip supply. And that's in all forms of housing. It isn't just about a council tenure. We work with the private rented sector. We work with other housing providers, supported housing, everybody out there in the housing market. And of course, our own um, SEMPRA homes for development of affordable housing. Um, but it doesn't matter what you do, you're never going to fill the, the, the gaps that are out there. I'm really proud to say that the team uh, was awarded gold standard, which was, uh, again, a national um, standard that we had to uh, meet every element of tools in the toolbox to deliver homeless prevention and the homelessness service and rehousing service. And um, we've achieved that which means that we do tick every box of different um, areas of work out there. But I don't want to steal the thunder of, of my two managers who are going to give you more detail about the services that we provide and some of the performance information that we gather. So I'm going to hand over to Phil, who's uh, prepared a presentation. If Emma can uh, put it on the screen, please. Okay, thanks everyone. As Mo said, my name's Phil Warren. I'm the Housing Solutions Manager who looks after the council's kind of statutory response to homelessness. Uh, Emma, if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, now, Housing Solutions is kind of a um, umbrella term or collective name for a number of the teams which together deal with all our aspects of homelessness. Um, as Mo said, We've got the housing solutions team, which is our statutory response. The officers take homelessness applications, investigate the cases, make the formal decisions for homelessness approaches. Um, within housing solutions, we have a team that deals with approaches from families. And also as a kind of result of the work from everyone in, we also now have a separate team dedicated to single homeless approaches. So rough sleepers, but also single homeless people that aren't rough sleeping. If we have a temporary duty, or if we have a, a duty to provide temporary accommodation, that's where the TA team come in. They'll look to find the most appropriate placement, depending on what we've got available at any given time, which fluctuates on a daily basis. Um, as you've heard, we all know social, social housing is in high demand and low supply, and that's where the private rented sector team come in. They help to move people on into settled accommodation in the private rented sector with our rent deposit schemes. As Mo just said, CEDA, which is the South Essex Domestic Abuse Hub, um, work across different local authorities but are employed by Basildon Council and fall within my housing solutions area. Among other things, they facilitate referrals to the refuge, liaise with police, support clients with accessing free legal services, and also help people to remain safely where they are by adding security measures to their home via the sanctuary schemes. We'll go to the next slide, please. So this graph shows the number of approaches to the service over the last three years from households needing assistance with homelessness for any reason, really. Uh, now, I'd love to be able to tell you there's a pattern to homelessness, but trying to predict it really is a fool's game. And you can see from the number of approaches there that it's far from regular, fluctuating considerably from month to month and from year to year. It does show, though, how incredibly busy the team are with anything from between 40 to 100 approaches a month. 
Each one of these has to be assessed and advised with a fair amount and also needing to be accommodated for a period of time. The fluctuating nature of that number of approaches demonstrates that homelessness can affect people for one of any number of reasons at any time. If we go to the next slide, please. And there's just a few of the things on the screen there, which you can see they've kept the teams busy over the last couple of years, as well as some future things that we're keeping our eye on. Um, during the start of lockdown, we had the government's request to accommodate all rough sleepers when the pandemic first started. This is something we continue to do. Um, we still provide accommodation to all verified rough sleepers. We had eviction bans in the private sector, which meant that the pool of available property shrank considerably and created a large backlog of court action, which is still ongoing. We saw the introduction of the Domestic Abuse Act, which made major legislative changes. Among other things, that resulted in an increase in the number of men fleeing domestic abuse, something that the sector doesn't really have a great deal of provision for. And more recently, we've had the collapse of cheap energy providers because of rising gas prices. There's another fuel price increase during April, um, so households can see their energy costs increase by as much as 50%, with yet another increase due in October. We also have the upcoming national insurance increase pending, which will see incomes reduce as people's cost of living incre increases. Now, the reason why I flagged this up is that we're always horizon scanning for things that may impact the service. And these kind of things uh, will impact the many families out there who have to finally balance their finances to the penny. And some of this will inevitably, inevitably result in some of them approaching us for help. If we go to the next slide, please. So this is just a quick snapshot, really, of the number of households that are in temporary accommodation over the last few years. Um, the main thing that this shows us is that year on year, the number of people in temporary accommodation starts off high and it only goes in one direction. It just gets higher. Why? Again, there's simply not enough a move on accommodation to go around. Now, whether that's in the social housing or private sector, people are just waiting for affordable and suitable accommodation to become available. And those are the key things, really. We can't just put someone into any tenancy. If we have a duty to rehouse them, we have to ensure that wherever they're going is affordable and is suitable for them in order to make sure that that's the right place for them and something that's sustainable. We can go to the next slide, please. Now, I put this one in just to kind of demonstrate that Temporary accommodation is something we say is a catch-all term, but really it means a wide variety of different things. Um, so I just wanted to make a moment to illustrate that it doesn't just mean any one thing in particular, like a hostel or b and or something like that, although that is part of it. It can be any of the things that you can see there on the screen. In reality, it's likely that a household will move a number of times while their case is with us. So someone may initially go into b and then a nightly let, then a hostel, then one of the council properties that are in our tem uh, temporary accommodation portfolio. Every one of those moves, again, means work for the temporary accommodation team and other teams, making sure that everything goes smoothly and that all the right rent accounts and everything are set up. So a lot of work involved in keeping people moving smoothly through that temporary accommodation portfolio. Because, of course, what we want to do is keep free those kind of crisis rooms at B&B &B and Nightly Let. So we've always got something immediately available for people. We run a 24-hour service. We're required to do that by statute. So we could get a call at any time from someone requiring accommodation. If we can go to the next slide, please. I think we may have skipped some there. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the blue portion of the graph that you can see in the background there is the total number of households in temporary accommodation over the course of the last year. And you can see there that for most of the year, that kind of bubbles around 600 households. Now overlaid on that in orange is the number of households in temporary accommodation whose cases have been accepted by us. So that means they've made their application, we've completed our investigation into it, and we've accepted that we have an ongoing housing duty towards them. So we've kind of done all of our bit for it, really. But we then don't have somewhere to move them on to. So they end up remaining in temporary accommodation for quite considerable periods of time. 
And you can see quite clearly that this accounts for the vast majority of the tenants that are in temporary accommodation. Having such a large number of completed cases in unsettled accommodation isn't great for the customers. They don't have stability. They can't put down roots. And it's not great for us to have our pathways silted up. Finding the properties to move people onto from temporary accommodation is one of our biggest challenges. Um, and if you're wondering what the makeup between the difference between that orange and blue bar is, if we go to the next slide. Okay, we've got another one. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk through it then. Um, as you can see from, from the previous one, if we just go back to that, the vast majority of people there are accepted cases. Um, we have a small proportion of people that are pending decision round about 30 to 40 cases at any given time are ones that we're actively working on. Um, so they're the ones that the officers are carrying out their investigations. We then have a small number of people that may be subject to management moves or discretionary moves. And then we have a handful that are at any given time are undergoing a, the statutory review into their decision. They've requested a review into what the homeless decision is. So that's it. For, oh no, I, I just wanted to add as well that Despite the many challenges, we have lots of successes. The team do fantastic work in homelessness. We have over 100 households moved into the private sector through our two rent deposit schemes. We have one for families and one for single people. Not only do we move people into those tenancies, but we work to make sure that they stay accommodated in them as well. And we've got an over 80% success rate in helping people to sustain tenancies in the private sector is really important in ending that revolving door of homelessness. Proactive work by the teams also prevented 114 households from becoming homeless in the first place last year and ended homelessness in another 110 cases. That's hundreds of Basildon residents positively supported through the, the trauma of the homelessness process and that's something that we're very proud of. And that's it for me. Um, thank you. Um, I'll um, open with the questions, I guess. Right. Um, when um, someone makes a housing application, do you mo monitor the number of people who um, get it wrong with the application and have to like provide a second application or more information to ensure that people are able to complete the applications easily and not get confused? I think this may be some referring to, are you referring to um, applications to the housing register? Um, I think they have to apply for temporary accommodation, do they not? Um, do they provide, provide, have to provide certain information? Yeah, um, well, if someone makes a homeless application, yes, then one of the things we have to determine is whether they meet the statutory thresholds um, for receiving temporary accommodation from us. Um, part of that is, you know, we'll ask people to provide, and, it, and it's fairly simple things like providing identification, providing information from their doctors and things like that if they've got some kind of medical vulnerability. Um, that's, that's really as far as that application process goes for temporary accommodation. It's then providing those documents to us that we can then look at to see whether they fit that threshold of being in priority need, um, as, as the statute calls it, and, and then and qualify, if you like, for want of a better word, for temporary accommodation. So it's not a, it's not an application form as such, because it, it will vary from household to household on what's required from them. Thank you. And um, you mentioned about the um, courts backlog. Obviously, that um, feeds back from the um, evictions ban that was in place some time ago. Do you expect there to be a sudden surge in um, applications coming forward all at once? And are there plans in place to deal with that? Well, we were worried about that last year, but the courts have started to progress things through um, since kind of like September time last year. And it didn't result in the kind of tidal wave of approaches that we feared. So it looks like things are, being, are going through in quite a sensible fashion and coming through staggered. Um, there was talk at some point of having what they were referring to as Nightingale courts to do a huge push on the backlogs, and that probably would have resulted in a big surge, but they've opted not to go down that route. So 
you know, we're kind of um, led by the rate at which court process can go along. Um, and that's not going to result in a huge surge on us. It certainly doesn't look like that. Okay, I think because I think the government did announce that they're trying to do a big recruitment of 4,000 people into magistrates court. Do you think if they got that, that might start actually increase the steady rate at which people are coming through? It may do, but we look to engage with people really early on in the process. Yeah. So not when someone's like, you know, getting the knock on the door from the bailiffs. We get involved with people right from the moment they get the notice from the landlord before the court process even starts. So we've got a kind of heads up on the number of people that are likely to, to become homeless. And right from when people get that first notice, um, that's when we'll start working with them. We'll start having those conversations with the landlords and we'll start looking to see um, what alternatives we can be looking at with people. So we're kind of, you know, not not sitting there waiting for the court order to come through the door for people. Um, thank you. And um, when you've got like council owned stock, that is temporary accommodation. I think for a while, like the Mason Nets over in um, Craylands were used as temporary accommodation. Um, does sometimes um, do the tenants ever request that that gets made into permanent accommodation? It can do. I think we're going to go on to Cathy's um, presentation shortly, and she'll show you what happens with a lot of our stock and measures of how we try and keep the pathways uh, for different clients open. But certainly, yes, decanting, you know, over 100 does have a knock on effect with, again, your availability. Thank you. Um, right. Um, do any other members have questions? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put my hand up there. Yeah. Yep, Stuart. Um, yes, how, how does the, well, if they're in temporary accommodation, how do the people who are in that accommodation um, seek to, to find um, suitable accommodation? Do they look in the private rented sector or do they bid on the council's uh, bidding system where you bid for houses that are vacant. How do they go about um, making a positive move to move on from homeless? It, it's both of the above, really. Yeah, so we one of the things we look to make sure is that um, those that are eligible to do so make an application to the housing register as early as possible so that they're then able to bid for properties. Um, but at the same time, we'll also encourage people to look for properties in the private sector right from when someone makes their first approach to, the, to us, we're always really honest with them about the levels and supplies of social housing and that yeah. the outcome is likely to be in the private sector for a lot of people. So we prepare people for that eventuality from right from the outset. Um, we give people the option to, to look for places in the private sector themselves and the, uh, the private sector team also work really hard in helping to identify suitable properties for people as well. So we kind of try and tackle it on both fronts. And um, obviously with the, the amount of um, cases you're dealing with, um, how do you sort of prioritise, is it sort of on the time, the time basis, like um, the first people to have been made homeless and then you're, you're dealing on the on the you're giving your attention to um to homeless on a on a sort of timeline basis or is there a sort of a priority well you kind of look at things on a case-by-case -case basis if someone's got like particular medical issues um then that the, maybe they need an adapted property and things like that then we try and make them get them moved out of temporary accommodation into something that more fits their needs as quickly as we could um, with people applying to the housing register, and I don't want to infringe on anything that Cappy might be about to tell us about, but it's based on you know people's band and the length of time that they've been within that band. Um, but we'll look we'll look to clear people out of temporary accommodation into settled accommodation. Um, ideally, the ones that have been there the longest will try and get them moved on, so people don't spend too long unsettled. Um, but it really depends on what accom accommodation becomes available and who fits the kind of the need for that. So it depends what size of accommodation and what type becomes available at any given time. And we'll then look to best match people to what's around them. OK, thank, yes, thank you. That was a question. So, Cathy. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, I've actually got one more. Um, I think um, Swan Housing is, I think, the biggest provider of um, 
um, housing association housing in the borough um have you been working with them and then because i think they've been taken over by a new um housing association have you been working with them um, to ensure the transition goes smoothly if i can take that one but we work with all housing associations so all that are based in basildon we work with and we've got nomination agreements with them for their void properties but i think it will be quite useful to see kathy Ayer's presentation because as i said at the beginning all our service does link together so we've got a customer's journey and we've got the homeless customer's journey but also people just in housing need that apply to the register as well so we're a balancing act between all of that to what um, accommodation we've got available but yes we do work with all the housing associations in Basildon and we work with them on a development front to try and um, create more more housing for us but also um with our register our housing register which we have a joint register and we have um nomination agreement to their voids i think it'd be useful to see perhaps kathy's presentation which will take you through that element and then um you can see the whole picture and ask some questions about the, how it all links together I'm just thinking about the new the new organisation that's been formed with Swan being taken over. Have you had any yeah. talks about that? Um, yeah, that will continue. And, and it's the same with Peabody. Peabody are, are emerging as well. So you often find with house associations that they have mergers, but they do have to um, keep to the agreements that they've already made. Okay, thank you. It's useful to know. Um, no other questions? Um, in which case... I think I've got a question. Oh, sorry, can't yes. see the hands up. <laughs> um, thinking about families with special needs, children with special needs, who um, their home has become very small or too small for them, what is the process? Yes, because some yes, sometimes the family has grown and then they need a bigger property and they're struggling because mm. of disability. Mm. Um, and I believe that there will be people in the system who have homes that are too big for them and some that have, have homes to, that, would, that are too small for them. So how do you yeah. make Kathy, that? I think we'll, Kathy will cover some of that in her presentation. Thank you. Okay. In which case, Kathy, do you want to do your presentation? Can you hear Kathy? Kathy? She frozen. She looks frozen. Uh, I think she has frozen. I'm, I'm just going to put the presentation up. Can you back? Are you? Are you there? Sorry, I'm, I'm having some connection problems. If I start breaking up, then um, please let me know and I'll have to log out and log back in. Apologies. Um, I'm ashamed because you were looking at me, you was calling on me to start. <laughs> Is that correct? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I do apologise for that. Um, okay, so um, I didn't hear um, some of those questions at the end, so happy to pick them up at the end. Um, so first slide, please, um, Emma. So has um, Mo um, introduced, I'm the manager of the rehousing team. Um, we are quite a large service and work very closely with Phil's team and we cover all those services that Mo um, explained and I won't go back through them all. Um, but um, as I say, it's very, um, you know, we do work very closely with Phil's team and we have to because we are entwined. So the first slide is just to give you, um, so this is to do with the Home Seeker Register, which a lot of you refer to as the Housing Register. Um, this is, um, if, if I break up at all, please let me know and I'll learn because it's telling me my connection's bad. Um, so this is just a, this is over a six month period, April to September of 21. Um, and we roughly get about two, 220, 250 applications that are ready to process. So we do get a few extra, but um, they, they haven't got housing needs. So they 
they want they would like social housing but unfortunately they have to have a housing need um, and then all these investigations will get investigated all these applications will get investigated um, thoroughly by the team um, assessing um, you know the housing need if they've got a medical problem are they overcrowded um, etc to work out what their um, banding will be their priority on the register and their effective date is generally the date their application was made unless they have any change of circumstances and so that's just to give you over a six month period of how many applications we're assessing each month. Um, next slide, please. So the next slide is um, about, I say, um, normally I say supply and demand, but I've actually uh, put it the other way around, demand and supply. So the first section is about the, um, the demand on the register. This is, in, um, again, this is the same six month period, April to September 21. And these are the um, people that are on the housing register. So, um, so if we take April 21, um, the blue represents um, studios, one bedroom apartments. So um, 1,104, there's 2,335 in total. 1,140 of those needed a studio or a one bed. That does include sheltered people that want sheltered housing as well. The orange represents 798 required two bedroom accommodation, which is our highest family need um, properties. The grey is 291, which is um, a three bed. The yellow is 83, a four bed. And the blue right at the top, um, 23, is people that require five. And we do have some people requiring six bed accommodation. Um, obviously, the housing need on the register is monitored all the time by the development team, um, because that obviously helps them decide what, what we need to build on our schemes. And so obviously at the moment we are trying to, um, predominantly we need two and three bedroom um, family size accommodation, but we are looking to build some larger um, properties like five beds to try and accommodate and meet the needs on the register. So base that out of the chart on your right hand side, which is the actual property side available to let for that six month period, balance towards the demand, which I think this um, slide will probably give you a good idea. So if we go back to April the 21st, the same month, when we had 1,140 people waiting for bed, beds, one beds or studios, only had 20 to let. So that's the supply, and, but that's the demand on the other side. Um, now, if you go to the August and September, that looks like we've got, oh, we've got a lot of um, uh, one beds and two beds, a lot in the other months. The reason for that was because we had um, some new builds come on during that six months um, and which obviously Mo was talking about working in partnership with our um, register providers and that was Peabody. We had um, 30 new builds that we had 100% nomination rights to um, and that was at Wickshelm House which is what was on the old Rylands hostel site that many of you will know at Wickford. Um, that was 21 two beds and nine one beds and they was all let to people on the home seeker register so that's why um, it seems a bit of a an increase in supply um, at the end of those that six month uh, period and also um, we are which I'll go on to um, explain on a future slide we do purchase some um, properties on the open market to try and replenish our stock as you know people exercise the right to buy and obviously that means we've lost stock so we try to replenish it and also during that same period it all happens at the same time uh, we had 33 properties from the open market come available to let to the home seeker register as well so that's why you're seeing a bit of a, an increase at the end of the six months of that period um, next slide please Emma so this really um, is, um, relates to what Phil was telling you about. So my team, although we allocate um, accommodation to permanently for the housing register, we also do find um, allocate accommodation for temporary accommodation. So Phil's team, the Homeless the Solutions team, um, they obviously will offer into hotel and bed and breakfast. But for those applications where um, the homeless officers um, have accepted a homelessness duty, we, this authority have a um, statutory duty to provide um, settled temporary accommodation until such time we discharge the duty into either um, a secure tenancy or into the private rented sector. So again, the same six month period, which is April to September, um, there was 84 people that we had to find stage, what I call stage two temporary accommodation. 
Um, so they may have been into bed and breakfast, they may have been into the hostel, but now we're moving them through the system. So if you remember what Phil said, we're moving them through the system. I've only got one pot of properties. So it's either they go out for the home seeker register or we use them for temporary accommodation. So that, that's the balancing act that Mo was um, referring to. So the first one, um, so each month it tells you roughly how many offers we need to do. So the BBC temporary stock only, this is, um, which was 55 for that six month period. That relates to what Councillor McKenzie was on about with the, um, so that stock, the where we are doing redevelopment schemes rather than leave the properties empty until such time they're demolished, they're still habitable. We use them for temporary accommodation um, and predominantly we use that quite on the Craylands, what is known as the Craylands estate. But we also have some other areas that we use predominantly just for temporary accommodation. And they're not available to people in the home seeker register. So that's, that's what we predominantly try and use. The 22 properties Basden Council's own stock is where we've had to use some accommodation that could either have gone onto the home seeker register for permanent lettings, or we can use it as temporary and obviously trying to find a balance act, we have to find accommodation for these applicants. We are, you know, this authority have got a legal duty to provide them with temporary accommodation. So we use some of our own stock. Now I think relating to one of the questions before my um, system um, collapsed, um, if we've placed someone into our own stock temporary accommodation, if it is suitable for their permanent needs, um, then they go into, the, so everyone that's accepted will go into the home seeker register. And then if the accommodation they're in as temporary accommodation can be made permanent and it is suitable for their needs, then we will offer that permanent to them to avoid them from having to move again. So a lot of people that are, although we've got high numbers in temporary accommodation, um, you know, it, most of them are in accommodation that can also be used as permanent it's just that they've got a different type of tenancy agreement they've got a non-secure tenancy instead of a secure and then the bottom one the housing association properties which we let seven um peabody used to be known as family mosaic um, they do have about 100 properties that they purchased on the open market many years ago um can't remember but probably about 10 years and um, that they purchased predominantly to specifically to um assist Basildon council with providing temporary accommodation and we use them um, and they're all full and then obviously as soon as they become void then we we use again for temporary accommodation and um but obviously they're the landlord of them properties so that's just to give you um, an idea of what the um, taking you through the system that Phil was on about what happens at the end of it when we've actually accepted a homeless duty to someone. Next slide, please, Emma. So this slide is um, trying to give you some information of um, about our properties. So the, the, the two big donuts, as I call them, um, covers um, April um, 20 to September 20, and then April 21 to September 21, six month periods. So if you can see the first um, circle, obviously that was during COVID. So it was um, it's when COVID started, obviously March 20 in lockdown. So we didn't have as much activities. We didn't get any new builds during that period. Um, we we got seven properties that we purchased on the open market, but we lost 17 to the right to buy, um, tenants that were exercising their right to buy. So we gained seven, but we lost 17. So we had a shortfall, of, we lost 10 properties overall in that six months. But if you go to the um, six months, um, the same six month period of the following year, obviously that's when we had all our new builds come in and our buybacks. So we um, had 39 new builds come in, um, which was obviously Rich Elm House. And we also had some separate homes properties that we also get 100% nomination rights to. Um, we purchased 33 on the open market that, um, that six month period. So we got 72, but we lost 26 to the right to buy. So we try and replenish them, but we do lose them at the same time. So because we got the new builds and the open market ones at the same time, I just wanted to give you a flavour of the last three months. So you can see we, so we haven't had any new builds in the last three months. We've only had one property from the open market that's gone through to completion, but we've already lost 15 properties to the right to buy in the last three months. So that's what I'm trying to show you on the slide is where, you know, the demand it, it, it's really difficult to treat, keep trying to meet the demand by supply because we're, we're trying to replenish, but then obviously we lose them through the right to buy. Um, and the next slide, please. 
So this one is um, obviously part of my service. We um, got downsizing, mutual exchanges, supported housing. Again, same six month period. We've got a downsizing scheme. Um, this has been in operation for about three or four years. It's exceptionally popular. <laughs> um, and this is for people that are occupying family size accommodation and that their children have left. They no longer need it and they meet non size family accommodation. So one beds or studios. To, um, so we offer incentives to encourage them to move to a property that meets their needs and it's you know less um, electricity and everything for them. But in return, we get a much needed family size property back. Um, and the incentives are, um, they get a dedicated officer to help them through the process. A lot of them are elderly because they're, you know, that's the ones the children have left. So they do, you know, they, they do like having that dedicated officer. Um, we, we pay for the removals, we um, fully decorate their new property, we fully carpet their new property, and we also give them a cash incentive of between £1,500 to £1,800. Um, so in that six-month period, we house eight, um, and we've got 59 active... waiting to they'll be eligible for those incentives these are particularly um, of interest to them all um and um, but that helps us get family much more needed family accommodation back that's currently been under occupied and we've got so many families waiting so that's been a really good scheme um and then mutual exchanges um 49 i've just gave you those figures because that's like a self-help process where they find someone to exchange with and then obviously they apply to the relevant landlords and then they just exchange tenancies um so, for example, if someone's in a two bedroom and needs a one and someone's in a one that needs a two, then they exchange tenancy. So I call it as a self-help process. And we're just in between doing the necessary legal paperwork to check that everything's OK. So that's a, that's very popular. We've got a dedicated officer that deals with that as well. And then the supported housing move on that I've just put on there was 10 during that six months. We have um, particularly um, youngsters age 18 to 24 um, many of them care leavers. They go into um, supported housing um, for to learn their independent living skills, to help them um, learn to cope how to manage a tenancy so we don't get the re revolving door and they, you know, foul a tenancy and become homeless. And that's really successful. We work in partnership with um, NACRO and Essex County. And um, are you all still there? Yes. My screen's yes. gone blank. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, my screen's yeah. gone blank, so I'll talk. <laughs> um, so, um, and so there was 10 um, for that six months. That's a really popular scheme. And um, the next slide. So this is just the final slide. Um, you're pleased to know this is um, what we put on our, um, so we've, um, my service has got Basildon Choice website, and that's where we allocate all the properties. That's where the people make the housing applications. And we've got information we update all the time on there. And also at the end of each year, we put um, a snapshot of our statistics for that year, which is this is exactly what's on the website now. So I just thought I'd put this up to show you. Um, so the keys of the little house you'll see down the bottom is our little logo for the Bazard and Choice site. Um, and that just gives you um, the statistics for 2021. Obviously, um, was telling you at April, at the 1st of April of 21, how many was on the household. It tells you how much current stock we had at that time, which was 10,273. And it gives you the breakdown of what that stock was. Um, during that year, we um, there was 26 people that went through to downsize. And 63 were on the register waiting to downsize. 71 actually went through the mutual exchange process, which was great. And 21 successfully um, managed in the, to learn their independent living skills and went on to um, be offered their own tenancy. Um, so for allocations, it was a bit low this year because it was obviously the COVID. We, the restrictions to start with on the first lockdown was we wasn't allowed to let any properties. We did carry on advertising and we did carry on offering, but we just had to delay the signups. Um, so we, um, we let a total of 472. And obviously I've done the breakdown there of general needs and sheltered. And we let 130 garages. They were stopped for quite some time um, to start with during COVID. Then the next one just gives you the breakdown of what those lets were, what size properties they were. And then the other um, 
chart is um, that 81% of properties, available properties went through the choice based letting, so they were advertised. And then 19% were direct offers. And they're normally either your wheel, wheelchair adapted um, or management moves or urgent um, cases that need to be, um, a particular property has to be found for a direct offer. And the next slide I think is the, thank you for listening, Mum. So I hope you found that helpful and open to questions. I'm sure there's going to be a few. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll go back to a similar question I asked earlier. Um, with the applications, do you monitor the number of times a person puts an application in and say gets it wrong? So they might send information, they don't have anything, they've completed it incorrectly to try and learn about how easy it is for people to fill out the applications and then to maybe adapt the process to make it easier for people? Yeah, so so what we've um, so when someone applies to the um, Home Seeker Register, we, we have a number at the end of it. So if it's got like number one, then I know it's their first one. Um, but if I can see like, you know, so what, what the officers, if they see someone has tried twice and um, and they're just not getting, you know, it's, it's not going through properly, then they will either, they, either they will contact them or the customer support service will contact them to advise to see whether they're having any problems. So especially if like, someone will keep applying, it doesn't go through, they'll apply again. And if you start seeing when they've done that four times, they're obviously not understanding the process. And sometimes it's because people don't understand, you know, the, they may be elderly and they're struggling with computers. Um, the customers, um, the CSC, the Customer Support Centre, they are our uh, front of house um, for our service. So they take all the telephone calls for vulnerable applicants, that um, people that haven't got access to a computer or they don't know how to use the computer, they will complete a form over the phone with them. And then they will print that off and we'll have that sent to them so that the applicant can check that all the information they've inputted is correct. And then that gets sent back. And we've also got computers in the um, reception of the um, Bassadon Centre that are available now um, and there's obviously um, you know people that are around not as much as before Covid but it is gradually getting back to normal and that can help them as well so and we also um, we also like if people are um, sending um, reviews um, against their decisions or complaints and if the same sort of things coming up that they're having trouble with this then we will go back to have a look at the form and see what where we can try and improve it okay, thank you does that answer um, your question yes it does very much so um on the um, buyback scheme you mentioned so is that only former council houses or does that include all properties or um even um what's that um part by schemes and, so, um, yeah, sorry was that the when well, the buybacks you, the properties yes. that we're purchasing yeah. so there is um the so we're purchasing um so when we identify um a shortfall in properties there's certain um budget available for us to replenish our stock as such to um purchase on the open market so um development team will actively look for properties on the open market that will may be suitable for us to use and then Basildon Council will purchase them. They are. Unless he might want to say more, she's got her hands up, but yeah. <laughs> yep, go ahead. I was just going to say there is a street acquisition, acquisition programme in place. It's not our preferred route, obviously. it's We would much prefer to build properties through the HRA and the Sempra Homes uh, build programme, but obviously that takes time and, and uh, previously we would have we didn't spend the money we would have to pay it back to government the rules have changed around that slightly um, but there are still occasion where it is preferable for us to buy uh, a property uh, you know a street property using that budget sometimes they're strategic purchases uh, sometimes it's because we need a certain type of property and we don't have that within our stock um, but generally speaking we would much prefer to put that investment into our new build program Okay, thank you. Um, maybe were the two questions for me. Does anyone else have a question? I've got a question. Yep, Davida. Um, yep. I think somewhere on one of the slides earlier, I saw that the number of applications per, is it per year or per month was 200? I think it's per month. Per month. Per month. Yes, per month was like 200. Are those repeat applications or are they... 
No, the majority of mm-hmm. so the majority of them are new applications. We do actually receive a few more than that. Um, but when people um, apply, the um, system is computerised so that someone is applying for social housing, but they haven't actually got housing needs in accordance with our policy. So if they're already in a two bedroom property and need a two bedroom and um, they won't qualify. So we don't process, we don't go on to fully process those. Mm-hmm. Majority of these new applications um, are, are new ones. They're not repeat ones, but it may be some um, maybe someone's um, been housed and they, they might have got something in the private sector, but they're now applying for social housing. But we do have quite a high um, new applications every month. But they don't all go on to be accepted. It depends on if the information they've put on their form, if it turns out that they have got housing need or if they can provide the documentation to support the information they're giving us. But that's why they all have to be thoroughly investigated to ensure that if they go on to be activated, that their circumstances have been assessed properly but we do have a high demand each month. So in terms of, so you've got about 200 each month um, applying. How many of those roughly would be a genuine um, application? Um, I would, think, would qualify? Yeah, like I say, I think the majority of them are genuine. Um, regards to the percentage that will qualify, um, I don't have that figure in front of me. I'm certainly happy to find that out for you. Um, but... I don't know if on the other slide. Um, see, has, has we approve applications each month, we also are making offers the other end, you know, so sometimes they equal each other, they equal each other up. Um, so when we had, you know, the batch of new builds and um, a, a lot of the um, open market properties come in, then the register went down slightly because we was able to house them. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly happy to get those um, figures for you if that would be helpful. How many, you know, if I get, if I look at a month and how many of those applications went on to be activated, would that, if that's helpful for you? Um, yes, please. And could I just ask, in terms of those coming onto the list, what are the changing circumstances for most of the people coming onto that waiting list? Um, so if someone's a council tenant and then um, they've maybe had more children, so they're overcrowded, they would apply for a transfer mm-hmm. or someone may be in a house and unfortunately they've got a medical condition where they no longer can manage stairs mm-hmm. and a stair lift and the property doesn't lend itself for a stair lift, then they would apply for a transfer to a ground floor, that, all number of things really, or they mm-hmm. they might need to downsize um, so it's normally either a medical and also people applying is um, people that have been accepted as homeless. Um, we've owned the council have only got a duty to provide temporary accommodation. So in order for them to get permanent accommodation, they would need to apply to the home seeker reg- register. So they also come on as well. OK. And is there any particular um, criteria or category, sorry, any particular category of people that... Um, if you look at the number of uh, the, if you look at the applications across board, would there be a particular category of people that's like a high, that's at a high level? Um, no, I mean we break them down into um, mm-hmm. homeless applicants, housing register applicants, and um, transfer applicants. So we know transfer means they've already got social housing and they need to move. Homeless applicants is because they're in temporary accommodation, the majority of them, and the other ones are because they're housing registers, they may be living with parents or um, they're in um, private rented and they need to move. Um, if you're on about the ethnicity, then obviously um, I don't have those figures, but it's I'm just normally just on the housing vulnerability, vulnerability and needs. Yeah, so vulnerability is someone, if someone's got a medical need to move, then obviously that will give them a priority on the register. Um, there's so many different scenarios that people have got housing need. Um, I wouldn't say there's one that is dominant over the other because there's so many different reasons um, that, you know, people have got housing need. Thank you. I think Mo's got her hand up. Yes, that's true. Awesome. Um, you, you first, Mo. Thank you. Uh, the team do review the register as well. So often when people have been on there a, a long 
length of time. It's funny how people always contact you when their circumstances get worse. You know, they've had another child or the medical condition has gotten worse. And so obviously we reevaluate them then. They never normally rec- um, contact you when perhaps their circumstances may have improved. But so besides processing all of those the team do also do reviews of the register as well just to do some checking that people's circumstances you know how they may have changed but obviously um it is a snapshot at a moment in time and people's circumstances often change on a daily basis and you know medical priorities can change regularly but we use um, an independent medical advisor it's part of a big consortium and um, it's not just sort of a gp they're specialists so that the, in the consortium you've got people that deal with mental health and different specialisms and and that's because we're not medical professionals we could never uh, profess to um do that sort of assessment and so we use um the services of, of a medical independent medical consortium um to review but we can only use the information that the clients give us you know so they have to supply the information and then we have that assessed and looked at okay um one more question if you don't mind yeah, it's absolutely fine. Or does Stuart want to go first? No, go on, Davida. Okay. Um, now, when people come onto the list, how long does it typically take them to be rehoused? Or how long? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, I think, as I showed on that, um, on that list, it really depends on the, uh, how many properties I have in um, and what they're priority is so someone that um has a higher housing need so if they're a medical one for example which means their property is wholly unsuitable they would be a band b so they probably wouldn't wait very long subject to the type of property that they need if someone is um just overcrowded by one bedroom but not statutory overcrowded they would be a um probably a band c from memory um so obviously they would be a lower housing need than the someone that's got a higher medical so regards to how long it would take it it really depends on what their housing need is what type of property they they want and where they want to live because it's a choice based yeah. letting so you know we may have a property that they like that would uh, we may have a property so say they've got a three bedroom housing need they, there may be a property, say, for example, in Langdon, that actually if they bid for it, they'd be top. And they can see that when they go on the bidding, that they don't want to live in Langdon. If that person wants to wait for something to come up in Pitsy, that's their choice. So it doesn't mean, okay. so they may wait an extra couple of months, but they could have got housed quicker. But, and that's the whole point. It's the point of choice, choice-based letting, so they can choose what areas they want to live in. Yeah, but to go still go back to the same question, Yeah. So about how long does it typically a year two years two months one week I, I i can't say it really depends on their needs so if i if i if i look at the singles for example that's probably a little bit easier so on the um on the website it does show you recent lets so someone can work out roughly someone with their same band that they're in and this roughly how long it took for that person but it is subject to a property coming but if i Probably it's easy for me to say that I'm, you know, for singles that need a, a bed sit or a one bed, um, they may, if they're open to all areas, then they may wait for sort of nine to 12 months. But that would be subject to properties being available. But someone that wants a two bedroom, that needs a two bedroom house, which are their highest family size property in demand, um, they could wait a number of years. It depends on how many two bedroom houses come in, unfortunately. I, I, it, it may be that, really and it can be that there's two bedroom flats available but that's one of the things we find a lot yeah. there are two bedroom flats that meet their needs but they're not going to bid on them because they want the house yeah that's right yeah, yeah. yeah. so we, we have had some inquiries where um when we check and they speak because obviously you know they're not happy about waiting when we check there has been properties they would have got would have been yeah. offered they would have come top but they've chosen not to bid on them which is yeah. absolutely fine that you know that is their choice that's the whole point of choice based lettings but there was properties available for them if they wanted them um but it is so difficult to say how long someone will wait because it really depends you know um what their needs are and, and what properties come in okay thank you yeah my, my question was about um the temporary 
accommodation uh, converted to permanent. It seemed to yes. me like if you if you come through homeless and you get in a temporary accommodation, say a two bed house or two bed fat or something, um, and then you make it permanent for them, hasn't that reduced the offers available to the choice based lettings because they've sort of gone through a different way, as it were? Because you hear tales of, uh, I mean, this is anecdotally, of course, that just that, you know, so and so got a property and they have, were less time than I was sort of thing and um, I just wondered if there was any um, you know why, why the temporary accommodations made permanent and not put into the choice based letting um, so some some accommodation we use for temporary accommodation can be used for permanent um, but it was just used for temporary so anyone that we've accepted a homeless duty to um, we've only got a duty to provide temporary but it's not the authority can't keep them in temporary accommodation forever so they can apply to the home seeker register. So they are on the home seeker register. Yeah. Um, and what they've been offered temporary doesn't necessarily mean that they do want it permanent. It's just that if they haven't been successful with bidding for nine months and their current property can be made permanent, then we will make it permanent. I think um, something to remember as well is that if, say, they've got a three bedroom need permanently but they're in a two bedroom for temporary we can make that permanent and they have to rejoin the list for a transfer into a three so they um they obviously you know have to re reapply for a transfer so not everybody that's in temporary accommodation wants that property as their permanent but of course if it can be made permanent then this authority has got to try and discharge its duty um yes. as soon as it can so but it doesn't happen very often, because we try to use, we don't, we try not to use as much as our stock that we yeah. can use for choice based lettings for temporary in the first place. So, yeah, okay. um, so that you know, that's not um, something that happens often, but it, it does happen, yes. And the other question was uh, you've lumped together the studios and the one bed, but uh, really, like the studio would be suitable for single person and the, um, the, the one bed house would be suitable for a couple. So it seems as if, uh, you know, you, you could split those out. Well, the reason we lump them together is because um, the, the singles can also apply for the one beds as well. They're not just restricted to studios. Oh, see, That's okay. why we lump them together. But when, it, when they're advertised, so if a studio was advertised, a couple couldn't bid on it. They're restricted from bidding because it's not big enough for them. But if I advertised a one bed, a couple and a single could bid for the one bed. We don't just restrict singles to just bed sits because obviously their, you know, their life would change, hopefully, in the future where they may need a one bed or they actually do want a separate bedroom. They don't want to live in a studio. So we've never yeah. we've never made single people just be able to bid for studios. And also we don't have as many studios as we have one bed. So that would be a bit of an unfair oh, okay. advantage to them as well. So that's why I've put them together because I never know which one of them they're going to bid on. And yes, I thought it, I thought at one time you were trying to um, find people to fill the studios, but you say there's not no problem now. Then. No, no, there's no problem at the moment. No, not at all. No, no, we we, we don't have any properties. Um, we we have. Um, we have some um, sheltered housing because we've got a surplus of sheltered housing. You know, we have a lot of yeah. sheltered housing. We have some sheltered housing that we have difficulty in getting housed, um, you know, getting offered because they're either on the upper floors and, you know, the elderly, yeah. they, they need ground floor. But general yeah. needs, um, I don't have any, what everyone calls hard to let. So I don't, I haven't had any hard to let for many years in oh, okay. general okay. needs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. and, and if I did, I would use it for temporary accommodation. But, even the properties that we can only use as temporary on the redevelopment schemes, they're in high demand as well. I don't have any of those empty either. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Mo, I think you yeah, I just to... wanted to add to what Cathy was saying uh, with regard to temporaries being made permanent. And say so we do have a statutory duty to try and discharge our homeless duty and get people made permanent. And even though if the property is slightly smaller than what they need, if we give them a secure tenancy, then those tenants can go on to try and find their own mutual exchange. And we've got, um, we signed up Basildon to some national mutual exchange schemes that's free for our, our clients. Yeah. So they can go on there 
and it and it doesn't even have to be within the borough it can be anywhere and you often are successful in in finding a mutual exchange as the figures showed you know we had yeah. 71 and the systems are geared as well it doesn't just have to be a swap one for one we've done as many as like a five-way mutual exchange oh, wow. where you, wow. you've got someone perhaps i don't know in a five bedroom wanting to go to a four and all of this and and oh. that can be quite complex oh, so yeah. you can probably show there's been in 71 some of those 71 were very complex moves a bit yeah. like when you buy a house and you're in a chain yeah yeah you know, it's that way. sort of thing so um yeah they're not not easy to do <laughs> okay thank you right. put my hand up um yes um just before the lockdown when i noticed that some of the people that found themselves homeless were shipped out to South End or Lee. Is that still happening? Because quite a lot of the, well, there was a particular person I had, um, mm. a particular case I have in mind, and she had um, a child who had complicated health issues, mm. and it was such a big problem for her mm. to travel in from wherever she was mm. moved to to, I, hos yeah. to the hospital. I, it's it's a, feel. It's, I just wondered yeah, if that's what I was going to do. Oh, no, it, sorry, no. it is the case, and, and we have to. Say um, that again, sorry. It is the case because Still we is. have to. We, we, our, our need is such that we've had to procure some um, bed and breakfast accommodation outside of the area, but some of that accommodation as well. Um, you know, you can't even get bed and breakfast necessarily within Basildon. It's very, very difficult. Um, we've only got the big chains in Basildon. We haven't got the small bed and breakfast facilities that allow clients to do their own cooking and access to a kitchen. Um, Basildon just isn't built like that. It's a new yeah. town and we haven't got that type of accommodation. Sorry, I'll let Phil, it's his team. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that, that, it's always been the case that kind of, we've used first stage crisis accommodation um, in other boroughs, um, most typically within South End because they've got uh, a large amount of stock of, you know, old Victorian B&Bs, which have then been converted into, into other types of properties. What I will say though, is that the team monitor those every single day and are always working to then, particularly with families to get them moved back into the borough as soon as they can. And it's, it, really is something that they look at on a daily basis to try and make sure that people are able to move back into Basildon when a property becomes available. Um, with families, there's a statutory limit that says you can't have someone in a bed and breakfast accommodation for longer than six weeks. And we take that very seriously. And we make sure that we keep to that limit and we don't have families in bed and breakfast accommodation for longer than that. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it does happen. Um, we try and keep that down to the minimum um, and when it does happen, we work very hard to get people moved back in borough. So are people's personal circumstances looked into? Because I know that this lady had a very, uh, had a very sick, um, severe, um, severely sick um, baby. And she was struggling to get to the hospital in Basildon. So is, is, are there conditions or the circumstances looked at before these decisions are made? Absolutely. But sometimes it just comes down to where do we have a space available? You know, the supplies of temporary accommodation are very limited. Sometimes we may only have one or two rooms on any given day. Um, so if it's someone that's approached us as homeless on that day, um, then it makes it very hard for us to do any kind of pre-planning or a planned move. And we really are restricted to what is available at any given time. OK, and you mentioned those um, the six week um, limit period. Um, what happens after the six weeks? Uh, well, if local authorities that keep people in bed and breakfast accommodation for longer than six weeks can expect to get a letter from the Secretary of State. Um, so it goes, it goes up to higher levels of government who monitor this very closely, um, who will then start asking them questions about why they failed in that duty. Mm. And, and if so, so where do they get more? <laughs> Sorry. So where do they get moved to in our in our borough? We have our own hostel accommodation. So we have um, hostel accommodation. We have premises that are managed by Peabody. Um, we also have our own accommodation that we use. And we also have 
um, as you saw in Cathy's presentation there, our own council stocks that we can use as well. Cathy, you have your hand up. I was just going to say to add on to that, um, obviously on my presentation where it showed that we do use our own council stock that can be used for the housing register um, on choice based lettings, but I use it for temporary instead. That is probably a good example of one of them where we have got some families um, that are in bed and breakfast, but obviously we're coming near the six week, we need to move them out and I've got no choice but to use the stock that ultimately I would have used for the housing register. It's just where we're trying to use all the stock we've got. So obviously that's why mine and Phil's teams work very closely to try and monitor. And, and obviously, as Phil said, um, they do monitor it daily and they obviously send that list to my team as well. So my team are fully aware of who Phil's team at any one time have got in temporary accommodation. So we're looking at that every day to see what we need to do. Most of the time we're, we're already um, identifying properties that haven't even become vacant yet. We're already identifying them for people to go in there before they've become vacant. That's how we're sort of trying to be proactive all the time on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no other questions? Then um, move on. Thank you very much for the um, presentation. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Shall we move on to the performance report, page 29? Um, Who's opening on this one? Stuart. Can I start us off, Chair? Um, so, okay. Um, I had uh, something to say. Sorry, could I just say, I just wanted to thank the housing team because I had a, a resident that um, <laughs> had been homeless for a long while. I um, mean, probably would know him the... Asian man and he got a house and I was really really pleased so I just want to say well done thank you thank you thank you okay go ahead Stuart thank you uh, um you're breaking up Um, we seem to have lost him. Has everyone else lost him, which is just me? No, we've lost him. Yeah, no, I've lost him. <laughs> um, a couple of Zoom. <laughs> Waiting. <laughs> Could I also say a big thank you to Leslie? Because... Um, I always send all these inquiries that get responded to quite quickly. So thank you ever so much. It's nice meeting you. <laughs> uh -huh. back on there a second. Mute. Sorry, and you too. I was on mute. <laughs> Has he disappeared completely? Yeah. Uh, I'll see if I can invite him back to the meeting one moment. <laughs> We we'll give him a minute, and if not, we can move on to Langdon and then come back. Move on to another one, yeah. We're waiting, is it Stuart? Um, we're waiting for. It looks like he's trying to join. One moment. Apologies, chair. I think um, I think I think my connection went there. Okay, no worries. These things happen. <laughs> um, all, all I was going to say by by way of introduction, chair, was um, this is quarter three performance report takes us up to December uh, twenty twenty one. 
Um, the committee now is uh, uh, no stranger to these performance reports, having received two uh, previous rounds of meetings. So I don't need to do much by way of introduction, just to remind members that the performance report covers the areas in our corporate plan, which are people, place, prosperity, and how we operate as an organisation. Um, the, um, the report uh, this time, uh, we listened to members' feedback at the last meeting, particularly members were interested in those performance areas that didn't have uh, targets as such, uh, and they wanted uh, a little bit more explanation about how the performance indicators worked when we were simply monitoring a trend. <clears throat> so this time what we've done is we've, sh we've shown them as graphs, and that way you can visually see the trend that's in the, in the paperwork in front of you. Um, and so, Chair, in, uh, in the performance report for quarter three, you've got each of the corporate plan areas outlined with the major projects and pieces of work, and then followed by the performance indicators. As always, um, the key to colouring of the targets is that um, red indicates an area of concern, uh, where we are off target, if there is a target, amber or yellow represents an area where we are very close to target, just below it, and green represents a trajectory where we're on target. Um, probably pause there, and just to say, Chair, that uh, we have on the call tonight uh, the directors and staff, as you know, from our housing service. Uh, we've also got Tomash, uh, the director from our growth service, uh, Owen, the director from our resources service, and my good self. So uh, we will field the questions that we can from members, and if there are questions that are relating more to the uh, environment uh, and leisure area, we will take those away and provide a written answer. Um, thank you. Um, first question for me. Um, so these are a limited number of performance indicators, I believe. Is there scope of having all the performance indicators given to the committee so we can just have a big overview of the organisation? For example, I think um, like you have indicators on sickness and fly tipping. We can. Um, what might be uh, what might be as well, um, Chair, if the if the members of the committee wanted to do that, it might be as well for us to run a session um, where we look at the council's performance management system, put it up on screen, or indeed give members access to it and let you have a look. I say that simply because uh, there would be hundreds of performance indicators. So one of the reasons that we pick some to show you is that it becomes a manageable list to discuss. Yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah. therefore, if, if members wanted an opportunity to peruse and to say, I'd like to look at this one and this one, that's absolutely fine. We want to be transparent. Uh, I just think perhaps um, a session where we put this, the system up live on screen and work through it might be the easiest way to manage that, that level of uh, information. Yeah, I mean, it might be even the case we do it once a year um, at the end of the once quarter four is available and then we have a big bit of a deeper dive into um, into the indicators. Um, OK, I'll open the floor to other members. Um, any questions? Uh, yes, I'm on page um, 39 of the, uh, uh, of the agenda. Um, just to responding to the domestic abuse policy, um, it's got a date of um, sending it to committee on the 26th of October. I just wonder what the situation was with that uh, policy. I think the policy was brought to a previous committee. Um, and as far as I'm aware, was approved. I think it came to the last committee. Enforcement. Um, yeah, it was approved by uh, public order and enforcement. I'm trying to think of the date now when it was actually approved, but the last uh, committee it was approved at. Well, the so last it's scrutiny. a live policy now. It's a live, oh, no, not a scrutiny. It went a to um, enforcement public order committee on i think it, from memory it was the 7th of december it's, it's been approved i'll oh, see so you've got that one okay um are we um how many um domestic abuse situations are we having to to deal with 
it fluctuates on a monthly basis, the same as any kind of homelessness approach does really. Um, some cases, some um, months will have a low number, some will have high, um, and it really, the, the nature of them changes as well. So in October, we had, I think from memory, around 36 approaches, and the majority of those were from men, which was a very unusual circumstance for wow. us. Yeah. And that was a direct kind of impact of the, the new legislative changes that the Domestic Abuse Act brought in. Um, but we'll we'll kind of we'll tend to to bubble around um, thirty to forty cases at any given time. And they come they come into sort of the um, the homeless criteria. Then do they? Somebody's uh, having to leave home, so they're that's where is that where it is? Yes, that's right. It falls within the um, the homelessness statute. Someone's homeless by by virtue of domestic abuse. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, okay, I've got, I've got another question on um, page forty. Um, the percentage of tenants in arrears is um, in the red, and that's basically over a third of council tenants are in arrears. Um, what's been done to address that? And actually, are there any um, targets to actually re- get to the target and then reduce the target further? Shall I answer that, Chair? Um, So we have, uh, several years ago, actually did a complete restructure of that team, put a new policy in place uh, and new new systems and processes in in place. And that was having a very, very positive impact on rent arrears. They'd been the lowest they had been just prior to um, the the start of the pandemic. Than they've been for probably about seven or eight years. So we're confident that, the, that everything that's in place is the right thing. It's just obviously COVID has hit and has a serious, serious impact. Um, Carol is currently looking at whether she needs to expand that team. But everything that was in place before remains in place. And obviously the focus is really on uh, prevention and, and early intervention. Yes, those figures um, are obviously are very concerning um, and have increased during the pandemic, but we're confident that over a period of time with everything that we have in place um, and the support and help in place, and obviously we have lots of other agencies as well, such as CAB um, that we work with and some other specialists that we are will slowly start to see a decrease in those areas. And what does the um in terms of those years, what is the picture like? Is it people who are say a month behind and constantly a month behind, people who are a year behind on their rent? Um, or is it, it quite fixed? It varies. There's there's a whole there's a whole raft of levels of arrears. Can you hear am I breaking up? A little bit, but I can hear you. Yeah, so it, it 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 varies. It's not just one particular category of debt. It's it's and it always is. It's not. It's no different now. It's always very varied. There's some uh, some high debts that have been there for a long period of time. Uh, that that obviously people have entered into arrangements. There's probably possession orders in place with um, with repayments in place on those. And then there are some other uh, new newer debts where people have fallen into debt more recently. Okay, I, I guess it's a similar issue with the council tax collection as well. It's, uh, was it in a good place before the pandemic? The council tax was, was quite strong before the pandemic. Obviously, um, over the last two years, it's it's taken sort of, um, uh, it's fallen away. Um, we've suspended all recovery action um, last year, and that has started again. And obviously, we're working with people who are still sort of vulnerable to support them. And that's sort of catching up slowly, but it's still obviously behind where it was two years ago. But it's improving, and it's, it is very similar to really the the rent position. There's you know, there's, there's there's different circumstances, different people, different levels of debt across the piece. It's quite a varied picture. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions from members? Looks like that's it. Um, in which case, um. All those for that item. Thank you for coming and thank you for your answers. Thank right. you. Right, um, let's move on to Langdon Community Centre. Um, who's leading on that one? I think yeah, that's. Uh, sorry, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, 
as um, we we took uh, we took an update on Langdon at our last meeting, and I think officers gave uh, um, qu quite a detailed res response. We thought this time we'd give you an update as to where we are at the moment. Uh, and members will be aware that Langdon Community Centre, as with um, all of our major uh, bits of work is reported through a service committee, which is where that has been reported. Um, sorry, I interrupted Leslie, who was going to give you a position um, as, as at uh, the moment with the community sense of progress. Yes, so we, we took um, a detailed report to policy exec in December, which sort of combined the, the property, the asset management, the building where we were with that alongside with um, how the activities are going on within it. So the how the community association was developing. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to report that that's all positive. So all the work that um, we promised that we would get done in phase one was completed. And obviously the, uh, the centre is now open. And really the next steps on the asset management side, on the physical uh, building side is to work with the, uh, committee to look at which areas we will focus on next because clearly uh, as soon as they can get back to full capacity that's going to help them in terms of their income and managing the uh, centre and um, obviously uh, Paul Brace's team are working with the community to support them uh, to make sure that they you know can, can keep the requirements of the lease and that they make that a flourishing um, uh, community centre again so you know so far so good uh, everything's positive both on the property side and also on the community side and we're having regular meetings with the uh with the community association uh to make sure that we support them in every way we possibly can um thank you very much for the update any questions from members um yeah well looks like but okay so you can i've got a question but not on this item if nobody has a no, question on this item. Councillor you keep um thank you for the update um i remember in the september scrutiny committee we did mention um that we would like a written report i understand it has been taken through a service committee but this is the scrutiny committee where we're supposed to scrutinize um so it's kind of the point of having a scrutiny committee. Otherwise, what's the point if you can scrutinize through every other committee? Um, and also we wanted, we raised that we wanted to be reported on the business plan as well. Um, so I, I feel like we need a lot more than what's been given to us this evening. I feel like we've made it very clear at previous um, committees that we do want more information um, and we have had legitimate concerns. Um, so I, I don't understand why we've been given another verbal report. And is there any plan at all for us to be able to scrutinise this properly? And will you at any point be bringing a detailed report, including the business plan, to us, to this committee? Chair, can I, um, can I make an observation in that... Um... What, what scrutiny generally does under its terms is it, um, as we said at the first meeting, is that it will look at the, the work programmes of the service committees and it will ask to see work that's going through those committees. So it's well within the remit of the report to have, to, of the committee to have the report that Leslie referred to that went to that service committee uh, and to ask questions about it. And if, um, if there is an area of a service committee that the, this committee wants to scrutinise further, Officers are very happy to raise that with the chair of that committee. Um, and you have at previous meetings of this committee had those service chairs here to ask them questions and to scrutinise uh, the work that's going on with them. So that may give the councillor a, a way forward with this item um, if there is a, a desire to have a greater level of detail. And I offer that because the work is already being reported through the service committee. Um, as Leslie outlined, uh, and sorry, Leslie, if I've crossed anything that you were uh, were aiming to uh, to cover in response as well. No, I suppose the only other uh, point to raise is that there's been an independent um, investigation and a, re a report where we pr produced from that, and I think it would be uh, inappropriate, really, ahead of that, um, to be having those discussions at any committee. Any follow-up questions on that, Councillor Okay. 
Yeah, can we have clarification on the independent investigation, please? So, um, so the, um, the leader of the council has asked for uh, a review of the um, uh, the circumstances, activities mm -hmm. um, uh, of that of that community centre work. Um, that review is under investigation and review is underway at the moment. Um, that will be published uh, once it is complete. We don't have it yet uh, from the, in the independent person who's carrying out that work. And all members will be um, able to uh, to look at that uh, review once we've got the report back from the investigator, the independent investigator. And indeed, as you said, uh, Councillor, in terms of getting more information back to committee, uh, this committee, it may well be something that you would want to ask the chair of the service committee to come and have a discussion with you about. Um, any follow ups? Okay, thank you. Um, in which case, um, the next item is the work program, page 67 to 69. Any um, observations? I, I did have a question about the waste strategy deliveries. That, can I ask a question about it? At this point? 46, page 46, even though the item isn't actually on there. Um, can we talk about pink sex now, or is it in the, or should we do that in another meeting? I think um, we've kind of gone past that one now. So okay, we'll then go on. You can move on. Um, so if we'll go on to the work program. Um, any observations on the work program? Um, you've, got, you've got quite a busy you've got quite a busy March meeting um, so we've got uh, a few items there listed um, I, I would imagine um, given the the committee's um, desire to scrutinize things in you know in, qu in quite a level of detail quite rightly um, you've got enough there for the meeting um, so you've got some big things there digital inclusion safer partnership um, you know general review of our policy and housing repairs performance with Morgan yeah. single contract but there's a lot there yes there is um yeah um any thoughts from members on the work program leave it as it is Luke. yeah and we may have to push them two bcs into the um next year potentially do you think well i think the housing repairs is uh, is important to get a, a review of that yeah definitely. so we do get uh a rate stream of uh complaints about that don't we inquiry yeah. or inquiries almost rather than complaints yeah can we make that the first item on the next agenda yeah let's do that then Luke. yeah um any other observations okay i think that's just for noting yep noted and that's it. Thank you very much, everybody.